mountain men, and three who became leading Santa Barbara citizens. My name is George Sampanis, and I will be your host as we open a window into Santa Barbara's past. Mountain men, a breed apart. My original plan was to tell the stories of Lewis Burton, Isaac Sparks, and George Nidever, three mountain men who found their way to Santa Barbara and became leading citizens and to provide a brief history of the fur trapping and trade industry and the men who touched and influenced their lives before their arrival here. I soon realized the story I wanted to tell was too long for one presentation, leading me to present it in two parts. Part one will focus on those men whose adventures and explorations touched and influenced the lives of our three mountain men. In part two, we will explore in more detail the lives and adventures of Burton, Sparks, and Nidever as we follow them on their perilous journey through the wilderness to California and on to Santa Barbara. As a prelude to our story, fur trading goes back as far as the classical Greek and Roman times. The demand for beaver pelts for hats in the 15th and 16th century caused the European beaver population to be virtually eliminated by the mid 1600s. Fortunately, not so for the beaver, the colonies in North America abounded in beaver. Our story begins in the late 1700s to the early 1800s. Finally, there are scores of other mountain men whose feats of bravery, courage, and adventure are too numerous to acknowledge. I have tried to limit this presentation to those that had a direct contact and impact on Burton, Sparks, and Nidever. Long before the arrival of the Europeans, North American Indians traded furs among themselves. Later, the Europeans would trade beads, textiles, knives, and other iron-based products for furs. Early fur trading companies depended on the Indians to trap and hunt the furs. Beaver fur was in demand since it could easily be combed and reconstituted into felt to make a variety of hat shapes and styles. These skins were especially valuable in China and fashionable Europe. The fur trade industry became one of the main economic ventures in North America, attracting competition among the French, British, Dutch, Spanish, and the Russians. Most American fur trading companies, like John Jacob Astor's American Fur Company, a beer moth like today's Amazon, built fortified trading posts at strategic locations in beaver country. They served as outposts for trade in the wilderness. The fur traders, trappers, and beaver hunters became known as mountain men. They opened pathways through the wilderness to the west, facing the unknown. Their first steps became the routes for the pioneers that followed. Between 1820 and 1840, the fur trade industry rose, flourished, and declined because of fashion changes, but not before they had learned everything of importance about the geography of the West. The Rocky Mountain Fur Company was established in St. Louis in 1822 by two Missourians, William Ashley and Andrew Henry. They obtained a license to fur trap in the Upper Missouri River area. They revolutionized the fur business by introducing the rendezvous, which was an annual trading event not confined to a fixed location. 
This was a substitute to the fortified fort. This concept eliminated the Indians as middlemen by hiring and contracting with independent trappers who would live in the mountains year round, finding their own sources of beaver. To accomplish his plan, Ashley placed an ad seeking 100 nomadic men with expert tracking skills who would live in the mountains for one, two, or three years. Scores responded and applied for the opportunity. 23-year-old Jedediah Strong Smith was one who responded to the advertisement. His six-foot-tall stature and his commanding presence and calm demeanor impressed Ashley enough to hire him and give him a leadership role. Smith was an adventurous young man, but one of his main reasons for facing the challenges of the unmapped West was to provide needed income for his aging parents, making arrangements for their care, as well as providing housing and schooling for his younger brothers and for his mentor, Dr. Titus Simon. In addition to Smith, over 100 men were recruited. The trappers traveled overland in small groups on horseback, avoiding the river arteries to both escape detection by hostile Indians and to develop untapped new fur regions. Born in Jericho, New York in 1799, Jedediah was the son of two God-fearing New England parents. At a young age, he was schooled in the Methodist faith and later mentored by Dr. Simon, a family friend. Dr. Simon not only strengthened Jedediah's faith, but instilled in him a love of nature and adventure and gifted him a first copy of Lewis and Clark's 1814 journey to the Pacific. Unlike typical mountain men, Jedediah Smith was educated, articulate, and a gentleman. He did not smoke or drink or use profanity. Wherever he went, he carried his rifle and three books with him, his Bible, his journal, and the 1814 Lewis and Clark journal given to him by Dr. Simon. He practiced his faith, prayed, read his Bible, and meditated daily. At the end of a long day of hiking in the mountains, he would light a fire, cook food, and spend the evening reading his Bible and singing hymns. His fellow mountain men thought his religion strange, but he won them over with his genuineness, honesty, and morals. Further, none could question his talents as a scout or his endurance on the trail, where he often sang hymns. Smith got his first glimpse of the Western frontier on October 1st of 1822, when he finally reached the mouth of the Yellowstone River in what is now Wyoming. Smith and some other men continued up the Missouri to central Montana, where they built a camp from which to trap through the winter. The following May, an Arakara Indian attack killed 12 trappers and wounded 11 members of his party. One of those wounded was Hugh Glass, on whom I will comment later. Smith's brave conduct during the Arakara massacre further enhanced his reputation and he became one of Ashley's chief lieutenants. Later that year, Smith and a dozen men headed west, making their way overland to the Rocky Mountains, becoming the first Americans to explore the Black Hills in South Dakota and Wyoming. In order for trappers to obtain necessary supplies and deliver their furs, Ashley told the trappers to meet with him in a large meadow near Henry's Fork of Wyoming's Green River in the early summer of 1825. 
This was to become the first fur trapper rendezvous. It proved to be a huge success as Ashley took home a tidy profit for his efforts. While the fur trappers not only had an opportunity to trade for supplies, but a chance to enjoy a few weeks of wild socializing. At the rendezvous, the traders, trappers, Indians, friends, and families ate, drank, gambled, staged horse and foot races, quarreled, and fought. Every spring, Ashley sent the men the supplies they needed overland on the back of pack mules. Every summer, the trappers would gather and trade their furs for tools, supplies, and luxuries at the rendezvous. The life of the mountain men was difficult and fraught with danger from Indians, animals, weather, and the unknown. They had to secure the furs they had accumulated for months away from thieves until the next annual rendezvous. Clad in buckskin clothing of their own making, they transversed the continent using only the goods they obtained once a year. Everything they couldn't obtain at a rendezvous came by living off the land. The fur trade industry encompassed a blending of characteristics from the French, British, American, and Indians. Intermarriage was a culturally accepted norm among the fur trade participants. For example, Kit Carson married an Arapaho named Singing Grass, and he adored her. They had two daughters, one named Adeline, her Indian name, Prairie Flower. Singing Grass died in childbirth. Carson later married a Cheyenne woman named Making Out Road, but her dislike for his children caused constant contention between them, resulting in a failed marriage. Soon, Making Out Road showed Kit the Road evicting Carson from their teepee, a Cheyenne form of divorce. Carson married again to a Hispanic woman named Maria Josefa Jaramillo. Josefa and Kit together had eight children. We will have more details on Carson later in this presentation. The rendezvous system lasted between 1825 and 1840 as the fur trade industry grew and then declined. The trappers were not fully aware that the whims of fashion in Paris, coupled with silk availability from China, allowed hats to be made less expensively, resulting in the demand for beaver pelts to decrease dramatically. The story of the mountain men would not be complete without mentioning Hugh Glass and his legendary survival after a savage grizzly bear attack. Glass was one of the hardy souls who was hired by Ashley in response to his advertisement. He was wounded in the Arakara attack that killed 12 and wounded 11. Glass was one of the wounded at the massacre. But his legendary fame stems from a ferocious grizzly attack. During Ashley's expedition of 1823, Glass wandered away from the remainder of the party when he encountered a large grizzly bear. The average male grizzly weighs roughly 800 pounds and possesses a bite capable of breaking cast iron. A bear could outrun a horse in a short sprint and its forepaws with sharp claws could easily rip a human from limb to limb. Bears are capable of bringing down a mounted man and his horse and feasting on both to satisfy its need to consume roughly 20,000 calories per day, or the equivalent of 48 six-ounce sticks. Glass fired a shot from his rifle, which hit the bear and enraged the animal. 
As the mountain man scrambled to climb up a tree, the rampaging bear pulled glass down to the ground and severely mauled him. The noise brought other members of the party to the rescue, but the animal was so close, the rescuers were hesitant to shoot for fear of hitting glass. Quoting James Kleiman, a fellow trapper and frontiersman, at length, the bear appeared to be satisfied and turned to leave when two or three men fired. The bear turned immediately on Glass, who had survived two savage maulings, but his ordeal was not over. When the bear turned to leave Glass for a second time, the party fired several more shots at the animal. With its dying energies, the bear jumped on glass for a third time, finally perishing and collapsing upon the wounded mountaineer. The rescuers were surprised once they removed the corpse of the bear that glass was still alive. Against all reason, he had survived being bitten and mauled several times and being crushed by an animal over 800 pounds in weight. Any one of these episodes might have killed the mountaineer, but Glass had refused to die. Examining the extent of Glass's wounds, the mountaineers pronounced the wounds mortal and made preparation for their friend's burial. They dug a shallow grave and two members of the party, Bridger and John Fitzgerald, remained behind, waiting for their friend to breathe his last. Glass was laid in the trench and Bridger and Fitzgerald nervously stood their grim vigil. Bridger and Fitzgerald fretted over being attacked by Indians. Since Glass was not sufficiently compliant to just die, the two decided to cover Glass with the hide of the bear and get out of there before the Indians arrived. Fitzgerald took Glass's rifle, and the two sped off to rejoin their party. Glass eventually came to, alone and covered by the heavy, stinking bear hide. He discovered his possessions were gone. Tending to his own wounds, he headed toward the nearest settlement, crawling at first, then slowly beginning to walk. Hugh Glass made his way towards the camp. He ate what he could find, mostly berries, roots, and insects, but occasionally the remains of a buffalo carcass that had been ravaged by wolves. Glass, though driven by vengeance, tracked down Bridger, but did not exercise revenge, mainly because the older Fitzgerald was the one insistent on leaving him, and Bridger was a lad of just 19. When he finally tracked down Fitzgerald, he had signed on with the army, safe from any retaliation. In the winter of 1832, the amazing survival story of Glass came to an end when an Arakara war party ambushed his trapping party, killing Glass and two others. Getting back to Jedediah Smith, his adventures read like a novel. He was in dozens of hand-to-hand -hand fights with Indians. He was attacked three times by grizzly bears, once escaping by jumping in a river, and once escaping as the bear hung onto the tail of his horse as it sped away. A third time, he did not escape. A large grizzly came out of a thicket and mauled him violently, throwing him to the ground, smashing his ribs, and literally ripping off his scalp. His head was in the bear's mouth, and it chewed off his ear. But somehow, perhaps playing dead, Smith survived. The scalp was hanging on to his head by an ear. 
as he waited for his men to come with help, he found comfort in the 23rd Psalm. The men found him in such condition and were horrified. Calmly, Smith instructed a fellow trapper and friend, Jim Kleiman, the same man who related the glass episode, to sew the hanging flesh back on. Kleiman did the best he could, but thought nothing could be done for the severed ear. Smith insisted that he try to attach it, and he succeeded, and somehow Jedediah survived. Jedediah's trapping, fur trading, and exploring adventures and discoveries are too numerous to mention, but he found his way into California in 1826. He journeyed west on the Mojave Trail, the western portion of what was to become the old Spanish Trail. Reaching the San Gabriel Mission, he was warmly received. Not so for the Spanish governor, who had him arrested as a spy and detained for two weeks. The governor released him conditionally and ordered him to leave by the same route from which he came. Once outside the Mexican settlements, Smith convinced himself he had complied with the governor's orders. Moving on, he crossed the mountains near Tehachapi and came into the Great Valley of California. He traveled north, but was turned back by deep snows. In May of 1827, Jedediah Smith, with two companions, successfully crossed the mountains in eight days and after 20 days more, reached the Great Salt Lake. In 1831, he led a group of 83 men, including our Isaac Sparks, along the Cimarron River, New Mexico. Short of supplies and devoid of drinkable water, the men separated each day in search of water holes. Smith was riding alone when a hunting party of 20 Comanche Indians attacked him. There was a brief face-to-face -face standoff until a Comanche shot Smith in the left shoulder. Injured, Jedediah wheeled his horse around and with one rifle shot was able to kill their chief. The Comanches then rushed him with no time to use his pistols and stabbed him to death with their lances. In the space of nine years, beginning with his first expedition in 1822, until his death in 1831, Jedediah Smith played a major role in opening up the Far West. He mapped his explorations covering thousands of miles, opening the way for the white settlers that followed. He was the first recorded white man to travel overland to California, the first to cross the Sierra from the west, the first to travel across the Great Basin, the first to travel north up the California coast to Oregon, and the first white man to cross the South Pass. Beyond fame as a frontiersman, trapper and explorer, Smith was a great leader and businessman, eventually purchasing the Rocky Mountain Fur Company. Other trappers soon followed his lead into the San Joaquin Valley. One of these men was Ewing Young. Young earned the title as premier mountain man of the Southwest. He was a tall, strapping carpenter from Tennessee. In 1822, he formed a partnership with a trader named William Bicknell and led three full wagon loads and 21 men, including William Wolfskill and Joseph Walker, who we will further discuss. This was the first crossing of wagons west across the plains to Santa Fe, a dangerous 1,000 mile journey. For the next nine years, Ewing Young maintained a base of operations in both New Mexico and St. Louis 
while operating a trading post in Taos. The Southwest never held the annual rendezvous as was common for the North. His post was a permanent rendezvous for trappers in the Southwest. Lured by adventure and profit, he told a friend, I want to get outside of where trappers have ever been. He did just that, trapping the Colorado River on the rugged western slope of the Rockies and returned with his pack mules loaded with thousands of dollars worth of beaver furs. Hostile natives were a constant menace. One trapper recorded only 16 out of 160 trappers survived a single year in the Gila watershed. In the spring of 1826, Young sent his partner William Wolfskill and a small party of trappers into the Gila watershed while he went on a trading expedition. Ten Apache ambushed the group, taking the furs and forcing them to return to Taos empty-handed. Young set upon evening the score with the Apaches. He led his party of 16 trappers into the village, routing them and inflicting heavy casualties. Another party trapping along the Gila included James O. Patty, whose narrative provides a written account of the first American expeditions into Arizona. Patty's group struck Pater, taking a large number of pelts. After a band of Apaches raided their horse herd, the trappers buried their cache, concealing the spot carefully. After returning with more pack animals, they discovered their cache had been found. Once again, a party of American trappers saw an entire season of hard, dangerous work in Arizona's wilderness go for naught. Young led a party up the Colorado River where they had another encounter with natives, this time the Mojave. An aggressive Mojave chief demanded a horse and when refused, speared the animal, causing an ang angry trapper to shoot him dead in his tracks. The Mojave backed off and left, but Young, knowing their habits, was ready when the natives launched a pre-dawn attack, killing 16 warriors. Returning several days later, they showered Young's camp with poison arrows, killing two and wounding two more. Patty claimed his blanket alone was pierced by 16 arrows. Young pursued the war party with vengeance, killing several and hanging their bodies from the limb of a cottonwood tree as a stern warning to others. As an added precaution, Young divided his expedition into two groups, one to trap, the other to stand guard. The persistent Mojave attacked again, this time killing three trappers. When Young found the men, their bodies had been hacked to pieces and were being roasted over a campfire. Young decided it was time to leave the Colorado River and head back to Taos. The 1,000 mile expedition had been profitable taking some $20,000 in pelts, but he had lost a third of his men to hostile Indians. Upon returning to Taos, his troubles continued. Mexico passed a law allowing only Mexican citizens to license the trap. Enforcement of the new law began when Young was still trapping in Arizona. Unsuspecting, his license was now void and the season's catch worth $20,000 was impounded. Young's next expedition to the Gila was attacked by Apache, who ambushed his party and killed 18 of his 24 trappers. Again, 
Young sought out the Apaches that had routed his expedition the previous year, whipped them soundly, and continued trapping. Despite these setbacks, Young equipped yet another expedition the following year with Young's best-known protege, Kit Carson. Kit Carson was born in Kentucky and raised on the Missouri frontier. He was 16 when, as an indentured servant, he left home and headed west on a caravan as a cook bound for Santa Fe. Learning through the leadership of Ewing Young and William Wolfskill, his mentors, he soon became a proficient trapper and trader. He accompanied Young on the expedition to Mexican California and joined him in fur trapping expeditions into the Rocky Mountains. As discussed earlier, he lived among and married into the Arapaho and Cheyenne tribes. He couldn't read nor even write his name, but he became fluent in speaking English, Spanish, Navajo, Apache, Cheyenne, Arapaho, Paiute, Shoshone, and Ute. Later, he served as a scout and guide for John C. Fremont and Stephen W. Kearney and served in the Mexican-American and American Civil Wars. Young took 17 men, including Carson, and headed west to California. In the spring of 1830, after a near disastrous journey across the trackless wastes of the Mojave Desert, they reached the Mission San Gabriel. They proceeded north, finding their way into California's Great Central Valley, and ventured further north to the Sacramento Valley trapping. They sold their furs to a Yankee sea captain. Having become the first American trapping expedition to reach the Pacific coast from Santa Fe, the young party returned to Arizona and successfully trapped the Gila. The party then rode on to Santa Fe, where they sold 2,000 pounds in beaver pelts, earning a small fortune for Young. Increasing troubles with Comanche, Apache, and Mojave inspired Young to move his base of operations to California. In 1831, he left New Mexico for good, eventually settling the Oregon Territory becoming one of that region's outstanding citizens. Young died prematurely in 1841 at age 42, having traversed over some of the wildest country in America. Ewing Young's travels and trapping expeditions were vast, crossing trails and mingling with other prominent fur traders, including William Wolfskill and Joseph Walker. Lewis T. Burton, Isaac J. Sparks, and George Nidever were three mountain men that came across the country to California in the 1830s as part of separate fur trapping expeditions. Burton with William Wolfskill party, 1831, Isaac Sparks, with the Ewing Young Party, 1832, and George Nidever with the Captain Joseph Walker Party in 1833. We will now turn our attention to William Wolfskill and Joseph Walker. William Wolfskill arrived in Santa Fe with the same Becknell wagon caravan that included Ewing Young and Joseph Walker. He spent the summer of 1822 engaging in trapping beaver. In his second season, he was accompanied by a New Mexican who had trapped beaver with him the fall before. It was January, cold with snow, as they lit a fire to warm themselves as they slept. Wolfskill was awakened by receiving a rifle ball in his chest Reaching for his rifle, it was gone. He would have been mortally wounded had the ball not passed through 
his blankets, his right arm, and left hand as his arms had been folded across his chest while asleep. He was able to rise and start on foot to the nearest Spanish settlement, 25 miles away. He arrived late the next morning, exhausted and weak from the loss of blood. Who should show up at the settlement but the New Mexican culprit? He approached the authorities reporting that he had been attacked by Indians and that his partner had been killed. The New Mexican had told the soldiers that Indians had shot Wolfskill, taken his gun, and that he, the Mexican, had shot several arrows at them. Dumbfounded, he learned that Wolfskill was alive and had given the authorities a different account. To determine who was telling the truth, the authorities returned to the scene where they found only two sets of footprints and no arrows in the snow. The assailant was exposed and jailed. Wilskill had many trapping expeditions with Young. The two partnered and on one expedition returned with $10,000 in furs and opened a trading post in Santa Fe, as mentioned earlier. During these years, Wolfskill applied for and was granted Mexican citizenship. In 1830, Wolfskill, with a group of 11 men and his employee, including R. Lewis Burton and three free trappers under the leadership of George Yunt, set out for California. A separate expedition led by Ewan Young included Kit Carson and our Isaac Sparks, who were to meet and proceed back to Santa Fe after the trapping season. That plan did not materialize. Both Young and Wolfskill separately decided to take on the lucrative sea otter fur trade business. Young made arrangements to use the Guadalupe, a ship captained by William Richardson. Wolfskill and Yunt also split up. Yunt headed north and later settled in the Napa Valley, while Wilskill went back to the Mission San Gabriel and set upon building a ship to use in his new sea otter enterprise. Both ventures proved to be unsuccessful. Ewing Young, not having sea legs, gave it up after a few days. He found his way to Oregon, where he was the first American to ranch, farm, and build a mill in the Willamette Valley. Wolfskill built his ship and then learned Mexican authorities had issues with his license. He and his ship were restricted to an area in southern waters where the sea otters were not as plentiful. By the time the license questions were resolved, Wolfskill sold his ship. Wolfskill gave up the life of a trapper and became a farmer. Buying land near Los Angeles, he planted grapes and received an award for having the best vineyard in California. He planted groves of orange, lemon, and lime trees and soon had the largest citrus orchards in the United States. He also invested in herds of cattle, becoming one of the wealthiest men in California. He became a leader in the California agricultural industry, served as an official in Los Angeles County, and is credited with opening the first American school in California. William Wolfskill died in 1866 at age 68, having been in the forefront of California's future citrus economy and having forged a new route west into California which served as an important factor in the change of California from a Mexican province to an American state. Joseph Rutherford Walker was born in 1898 in Tennessee, moved to Missouri, and continued making his way west. 
When he was 15 years old, he and his older brother Joel enlisted in Colonel John Brown's Mounted Rifle Company, serving under Andrew Jackson in the Creek Indian Campaign and fighting alongside Sam Houston at the Battle of Horseshoe Bend. As a 20-year-old, he was hunting and trapping in the Southern Rocky Mountains when arrested by Mexican authorities for not having a license to trap. He served a short prison term, but won their favor by helping the Mexicans in their war with the Pawnee Indians. As a reward, he was granted rare trading privileges, leading him to explore remote regions. At age 26, Walker was hired as a guide for the first U.S. government survey of the Santa Fe Trail. Upon his return to Fort Osage, Missouri, the governor asked Walker to select a site for a new town. Walker named the new town Independence and agreed to serve as Jackson County's first sheriff. One of his duties as sheriff was to review advertisements and look out for runaway slaves and indentured servants. One advertisement posted in 1826 ended up on his desk. Christopher Carson, a boy about 16 years old, small for age, but thick set, light hair. Carson had run away from a saddle maker who offered a reward of one penny for his return. Walker took a liking to the lad. Rather than returning Carson to his master, Walker put him in the care of his tower's trap of friends. Wolfskill hired Carson to take care of his horses, nicknamed the boy Kit, and eventually taught him to become a first-rate trapper. Walker, Wolfskill, and Carson remained lifelong friends. In 1830, while driving horses to Fort Gibson in Oklahoma, Walker met Benjamin Bonneville, a French-born officer in the United States Army, fur trapper and explorer. In 1832, he accompanied Bonneville in the first ever expedition over South Pass into the Green River Valley. The following year, Bonneville sent Walker, now 34, in command of a party of 36 men, including our George Nidever, from the Green River to find an overland route to California. While we do not know his exact route, the party made a subtly crossing over the Sierra. The arduous journey was fraught with Indian encounters, freezing cold temperatures, rugged terrain, and precipitous drops. Nearly frozen to death, they survived by eating frozen insects, berries, and horse flesh. Their spirits were recharged as Walker and his men were rewarded with an amazing sight that no white man had ever before seen. The northern rim of Yosemite Valley at the plunge point of North America's tallest waterfall staring into the most awesome mountain chasm on the continent with its majestic waterfalls and the mighty redwoods. They eventually made their way to Monterey, where six of the party, included Nidever, got permission from Walker to stay in California. On February 14, 1834, the rest of the Walker party headed east at the base of the Sierra, they turned south in search of an easier crossing than the one they used on the westward trip. He found it, and it was later named the Walker Pass. The party then turned north through the desert, nearly dying of thirst before reaching the Humboldt Sink. Zenas Leonard, who acted as a clerk for the expedition, wrote a narrative that gives a circumstantial account of the entire route. In the Bancroft Library, there is a manuscript 
dictated by George Nidever, which corroborates many of the incidents recorded by Leonard. A third source, Joe Meeks, The River of the West, substantiates the account. This route was to become the main trail to California. In 1843, Walker led a train of 22 wagons, being the first to cross the South Pass on what would become the Mormon Trail. In 1849, he joined the flood of men during the gold rush, selling cattle to the miners, as well as leading prospecting expeditions. Years later, at age 64, he led a group of prospectors near Prescott, Arizona, where they struck gold. When he finally settled down on his California ranch in 1867, nearly blind and approaching 70 years old, the intrepid mountain man remembered a single day as the best of his life. He asked that a remembrance of it be carved on his tombstone. Camped at Yosemite, November 13th, 1833. He died at age 78, having earned a reputation as a gentleman who garnered great respect from his fellow mountaineers. He was a great leader. In over 40 years, he led hundreds of trappers, traders, and immigrants, not losing a single man. He was a hero to John Fremont and held in the highest regard by Kit Carson. George Nightever called him one of the best leaders I have ever met. His name survives today on Walker Pass, Walker Lake, Walker River, Walker Valley, Walker Gulch, Walker Canyon, Walker Creek, Walker Trail, Walker Peak, Walker Mining District, Walker, Arizona, and Walker, California. In part two, we will explore in detail the lives and adventures of Burton, Sparks, and Nidever as we follow them on their perilous journey through the wilderness to California and on to Santa Barbara. We will accompany them as they are transformed from land-loving mountain trappers into otter-hunting, seagoing skippers and honored Santa Barbara citizens. Mm -hmm.